Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Pro. I think we've got a really fun show in place for you. Very special guest joins us a little bit later on. Happy to have Kaylee Manzel on the show today. Really excited about that. Also, Georgia kind of got over on its fans yesterday, perhaps with a little bit of a April Fool's joke. We'll talk about that. And I think I have an idea that could actually unite all of Dog Nation. I'll tell you more about that here coming up in just a little bit. Also, some really good stuff on Stetson Bennett off the top of the program today. Two things here. One, related to an outlook for what I think that Beck might be able to do here this year. Did I say Carson Beck? Carson Beck is the quarterback of Georgia this year. That's the guy we're talking about here today. It's going to be a fun conversation, I promise. I'll just tell you more about it when the show starts, but we're happy to have you with us for it. It's Dog Nation Daily. The Daily Podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by ServPro, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by ServPro. Cleaning, restoration, construction. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I was talking to our video audience a moment ago, and I was saying that you can definitely feel sort of a, a different vibe in the area this week. I live in the Atlanta area. There's much less traffic. We have this giant corporate headquarters in which Dog Nation World Headquarters rest, and it's a lot quieter around here this week. There's definitely spring break in the air. Not everybody in our area has spring break at exactly the same time, but it seems like this week is the most common week for that. So kind of post-Easter, pre-G-Day, there is definitely sort of a springish vibe. Now, here at Dog Nation World Headquarters, we are full-staffed and full-go like we always are, but the mood is perhaps a little bit different. So in keeping with that, I want to try to keep the show very fun today. We try to have fun as much as we can anyway, but today perhaps even more so than normal. Special guest later on helps us do just that. Kaylee Manziel going to join us. I'm very excited about having Kaylee on the uh, program today. But I want to begin this way with the idea of what's fun about Georgia football right now. And I think that it's really cool to think about being in Athens for GD on April 13th and the season that's going to come in the fall after that. And the vision of this Georgia football team led by quarterback Carson Beck here this year and the fact that I think that Beck, given his stature, given what he can be and what it's going to be his final year at Georgia, and just given the fact that this is a little bit unique for Georgia to be led by quarterback, perhaps more so than it has at any point in time in the Kirby Smart era, and maybe as much as it has been at any point in time in a previous era of Georgia football, it all just really sets up for a guy like Carson Beck to potentially have a really special season. And taking some time, kind of well removed, several months ahead of the upcoming season, to sort of imagine exactly what that could look like. It just sort of seems like kind of a, a fun thing to do. And it's easier to do after a week in which we've heard some fairly interesting things from Kirby Smart. I want to start with this. So Kirby Smart was on the Atlanta radio station 92.9, the game the other day, the show known as The Steakhouse. And in this interview, uh, Kirby was talking about the decision of Carson Beck to come back to George, the process that Beck under, uh, underwent to do all of that, and the timing aspect of this that was important to Carson. And I think this is a really introspective kind of look from Kirby Smart at what happened behind the scenes on all of this. And as I said before, I think it sets us up to have a really fun and entertaining conversation about what Carson can do since he's made the decision to come back to Georgia. So let's start with this. Kirby from the Steakhouse on 92.9 The Game in Atlanta just the other day. The discussions were, were, were very, uh, I guess, controlled. He, he, he was very thoughtful about it. He businesslike. He, he's talking about the rest of his career, and he had a really tough decision because he played well enough at the end of the year to kind of ascend and move up. And you know, a lot of people thought during the draft process that he would move up because the style of offense he plays in fits right into what these NFL teams want to do. They know he's really intelligent. He's already played in a system that's at the Baltimore Ravens with Coach Muckin, and, and Mike's added some things. So the talks were easy. Um, they were very... Uh, he just he just he went about it the right way. He included um, his mom. He included his his uh, quarterbacks coach back home. Um, but the most important thing was he wanted to do it in a timely manner where it could affect other receivers. We were losing some receivers to the draft. Ladd and Rosemi and some of those guys, Brock, as a receiver, we needed to replenish some of our receivers. So if he was going to have an impact on his team, he needed to make this decision and move on so we could get some guys out of the portal. 
I love hearing the thought process from Carson Beck and the fact that once Beck determined that coming back to Georgia was going to be the right thing for him, he wanted to do it in the kind of timely manner that allowed Georgia to add some pass-catching weapons to the transfer portal. And we believe that a guy like Colby Young, who we've talked a lot about, we think he can have a really big season for UGA. We think, you know, London Humphreys and Michael Jackson, they might be able to be contributors too, but adding a guy like Colby Young – based on the buzz and the chatter that's out there about him, that's a pretty big deal. And maybe Ben Urasek, who's going to be here in the summer, maybe that turns out to be that way there too. But but Beck wasn't just looking to make the right decision for himself. He was looking to make Georgia better in the process. And I think if you're a UGA fan, you you like to, to hear that. I think you should anyway. You probably do. The other thing that sort of jumps out to me, hearing Kirby Smart say what he says there on 92.9 The Game, is – this is the kind of conversation that perhaps doesn't always take place. That, you know, Georgia is going to be a championship contender for as many years in the future as we're able to see and has been kind of at that relevant national level for a, for a good long period of time uh, there as well here during the smart era. But even for a program like Georgia, it doesn't always work out this way that a quarterback who maybe could have been in a conversation to be a very high draft pick in this year's draft is deciding to come back to Georgia. Like, that's a real significant luxury. Even for a team like UGA that's used to being talent-rich, having a quarterback like Beck getting ready to come back, that's even a big deal for a program like like Georgia who kind of always expects to be on the national scene. But this just feels a little bit different because of the potential s- stature a quarterback like Beck could aspire to, to, to have. And so it kind of gets my mind wondering a little bit of, well, what specifically could that mean – and how specifically could that show up for Georgia here this year? And sometimes when I have a, the ability to sort of whittle this down to kind of a simple idea, I try to do that. And simply speaking, when I kind of hear the positive chatter coming out about back during spring practice, the stuff that Kirby Smart is saying, when I hear all of that, it leads me to believe that I think Carson could aspire to – about anything here this year and have a chance to have that potentially come true for him. For instance, I was looking at this, you know, sometimes I'm not always great at remembering these kinds of things. You know, what is the single season record for Georgia program history in terms of touchdown pass thrown? And that's uh, Aaron Murray. You go back to, to Murray and I think it's 2012 at 36 touchdown passes thrown. And you look at that and you think, gosh, you know, could Carson Beck, break that record here this year? Could he match that number here this year? That'd be far and away greater than anything any other quarterback has done during the smart era. Georgia has just been a little bit more balanced in terms of how it scores its touchdowns. We've talked about that before. But this year in his kind of final year, could could Beck achieve something that rare? If he did, by the way, if Carson did throw 36 touchdowns, that would put him right about the number that Michael Penix was at last year. That was good enough for third best in America last year. There are a couple of guys who had 40, including Jaden Daniels, but Penix was, you know, talked about as one of the best quarterbacks in the country all, all year long, essentially put Washington on his back along with some really good wide receivers and got that team to the college football playoff. That's the kind of year that, that perhaps Carson Beck could aspire to have here this season. I think that's totally reasonable, especially for a quarterback like Beck. When you look at passing yards per game, passing yards per attempt, a lot of those numbers, Beck is already near the national leader. And I think the the one kind of final frontier for him, the final frontier for the Georgia passing offense, as we've discussed before, is that ability to kind of break through and just throw more touchdowns, score about the same number of points. Georgia's been, you know, a 40 you know plus point per game offense for like the last three years, but maybe a little bit more balance in how you score those touchdowns could maybe make Georgia a little bit more difficult to defend against. And I don't think there's any reason why Carson Beck couldn't aspire to that level of greatness here this year, as good as any Georgia quarterback's ever been in a single season in terms of touchdowns thrown, and right there near the top of the country uh, in in terms of uh, that same stat there as well. I don't think there's any reason that Carson Beck couldn't aspire to that here this season. But as you have the conversation about Carson – I think the overall story for Carson at Georgia here this year goes beyond that, even as impressive of a stat line as that would turn out to be if that's indeed what this season has in store for Beck. I think there's something even more important than that that Carson Beck's presence provides for UGA. And I want to go to a different statement from Kirby Smart about Beck. This is from the ESPN 
print interview they ran the other day, the Q&A with Chris Lowe, Kirby said something in this interview about Bag that, that really stood out to me. I want to give you the question and the answer. So Lowe, the reporter, asks, what's it been like to watch Carson Beck's transformation at quarterback from a year ago when he was competing for the starting job to where he is now as a preseason Heisman Trophy candidate? Smart's answer is really interesting. He says he's Mr. Mellow out there. The guys in the locker room love him because he's confident, calm, and very smart. Even though he's got a little bit of arrogance to him, he's not holier than thou like you see with some quarterbacks. Earlier in the year, last season, we probably didn't did try to protect him too much. But then you see nothing ever really affects him, and you know you've just got to let him, he says, let the cat go play because we're either going to make it or not make it on his back. As the year went on, he got better and better, but we were probably a little slow, uh, too slow with him out of the gate, Kirby Smart says. And I would say that's probably true. True. I I think at the beginning of the year, South Carolina game, think about that. Maybe a little bit the Auburn game. Georgia probably didn't fully unleash its offense as well as it could. And had it done more so, perhaps the stat line for Beck this past season could have even been more impressive. But that's actually not the point that jumps out to me on the uh, statement there from Kirby Smart in the print interview at ESPN.com the other day. The thing that jumps out to me is when Kirby Smart says his teammates love him that his teammates love him. Boy, that really means something to me. And the reason why is, is because we've talked to Jake Fromm about this so much in the past. When you're a quarterback and all eyes are on you, you cannot fake it in the locker room. You've either got it or you don't. And the people in that locker room, they've got the inside information. They're seeing you when you're not with the coaches. They're seeing you when you're at your worst. They're seeing you on a daily basis. And I would say there is nothing more important for a quarterback than the answer to the question of, do your teammates trust you? Do your teammates believe in you? Do your teammates want to go to battle with you and for you? Because if you're the kind of quarterback that generates that kind of feeling among your teammates, then typically speaking, good things can happen for an organization when that's true. Good things can happen for a college program when that's true. We even have an example of that very fact from from Georgia football of the recent past. Think back to 2021 for a moment. 2021 is easy to forget that there were a lot of moments in that season, especially in the early going, where it was not obvious to the eyes of some that Georgia was going to win its first national championship within 40 years and its first national championship with Kirby Smart as head coach. Remember, the season had began with JT Daniels supposed to be the quarterback that was doing the kinds of things that Carson Beck is doing right now. He was supposed to be the guy, and then he got hurt again. And then you had this situation where it just wasn't quite working out for him, and lo and behold, out of nowhere, Stetson Bennett sort of stepped up and stepped to the forefront, and all of a sudden Bennett was doing the kinds of things at Georgia that people maybe didn't think was possible for Bennett for certain and maybe not even possible for the quarterback position at UGA given the personality that Georgia had kind of played with prior to that. But Bennett was earning trust week after week after week, perhaps slowly at times with fans, but apparently behind the scenes much quicker with some of his Georgia teammates. There was the game against Florida in 2021 when Georgia used a big barrage defensively near the end of the half. Nicobe Dean, Nolan Smith, those guys kept forcing turnovers. That built a big lead for Georgia, and ultimately the rest was history. Brock Bowers had an amazing catch that day. But Stetson Bennett admittedly did not have a very good game. And he was drawing the ire of some fans. There was some media, of course, trying to fan the flames of that and cloud chasing, you know, as a way of trying to, you know, to do that. But but it wasn't always all positive for Bennett during that year at Georgia. Many of you, of course, remember this. And the thing I'll always remember about that game against Florida was that day, Nolan Smith, who was always such an articulate spokesman for Georgia football, stepped to the forefront and offered a fiery defense of Bennett that let you know just how popular Stetson Bennett was in his own locker room. And in a lot of ways, this would foreshadow the playoff success that Georgia would go on to enjoy. I want you to see this back from October of 2021, the moment we found out just how much that locker room truly believed in Stetson Bennett. This is a remarkable thing to go back and relive. Y'all always, I want to say something about my my quarterback now, Stetson Bennett, the mailman. Y'all call him a weak, 
weak point. I read all the stuff on media. I know I'm not supposed to. But one thing about Stetson, he just works. He don't listen to nobody. He just works. He a blue collar guy. And <clears throat> when you talk about trusting a guy, I, I, I trust him because he go out there and work and, and put his best foot forward every day, even though it may not look pretty to y'all, but he's getting the job done. Let me sum all this up this way. I think the average Georgia fan believes in Beck now more so than the average Georgia fan perhaps believed in Bennett then. But what we found after that Florida game was the locker room believed heavily in Bennett. So when Stetson Bennett made big plays in that year's college football playoff and then came back and did the same thing the following year, it perhaps should not have been a surprise to us because the people who knew Stetson Bass, guys like Nolan Smith, knew apparently what he was capable of doing, so much so that unsolicited uh, Nolan Smith stepped to the forefront to defend him there that day. That was a very meaningful moment. And when Kirby Smart to the pages of ESPN.com says, these players believe in Carson Beck, they trust in Carson Beck, that really matters to me. The belief that a team can have in a quarterback has foreshadowed a Georgia national championship in the past. And maybe that same level of belief these players have in uh, Carson Beck for right now could suggest just how much success could be in store for Georgia this year as well. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by our friends at Surpro. Good to have you with us across all video platforms at 10 a.m., radio, Athens Sports Radio 96, the ref podcast there as well. Apple, Spotify, posting the show at noon every day there at the worldfamousdognation.com. Just happy to have you as a part of the program as said before. So thankful to our friends at Serve Pro there as well. One of our newer sort of daily sponsors on our program, but man, we love them. They've actually been with us as a part of the show in some form or fashion for a good long time, and now they get Tuesdays in the spotlight here, which I just really love. I love telling their story because we've actually used Serve Pro here at our Dog Nation World Headquarters studios before. It's our old studio, but nonetheless, we have experience using them, and I can tell you, that when we had a major water intrusion uh, a couple of years or so ago, water just like a pipe bust and everything just a total mess, our friends at Surpro came and they cleaned it up for us and they literally put it back together like it never even happened. That is what Surpro is all about. What their workers are called, and I love this, they're restoration specialists. They specialize in restoring your property to its pristine condition, the way that it looked before fire may have uh, damaged, before water kind of spewed all over the place. Whatever that is, Serve Pro is there to clean that up for you. Every franchise independently owned and operated there as well. That's a really good thing, I think, there too, because you're talking about working with folks who have a vested interest in a satisfactory outcome the same way that you do. That's what our friends at Serve Pro are all about. So please find them online. It's servepro.com, S-E-R-V, servepro.com. One more time, S-E-R-V, servepro.com. You've got property, whether it's the home you live in or your commercial property where your business is housed or whatever, if it's damaged by fire, if you have a water pipe bust or, you know, uh, roof leaks and rain gets everywhere, whatever that story is. If you got a mess that needs to be cleaned up, let the restoration specialist of ServPro do it for you. One more time. It's ServPro.com. S-E-R-V. ServPro.com. All right. On our show here coming up in a moment, I believe I mentioned this, great special guest, Kaylee Manzel, going to join us here in just a little bit. We're really excited about having her today. Uh, she's been doing a great job uh, with the Dog Nation show on Thursdays. We'll let her tell you more about that. We're also going to have some fun with some of the topics around Georgia football here right now, including some stuff on Carson Beck here coming up in just a moment, too. Prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse. Yesterday was, of course, April Fool's. We did not try to April Fool you. One of these days, we may try to do something, like, really big for April Fool's. But as I said before, if we can't do it really big, we probably don't want to do anything at all. My wife tried to fool my kids yesterday. They didn't fall for it. You know, people, kids are just getting more savvy about stuff like that these days, it seems like. But Georgia football had uh, what I would guess is a pretty fun attempt at an April Fool's joke yesterday. Most fans didn't really fall for it. Most fans seemed to sort of get it. But at the same time, they kind of had some uh, ha had some fun with this, too. I'll show you on the screen if you're watching a video. So Georgia put out the 152 days, basically like acting like it's a countdown to the season, and they kind of teased the black jerseys. And – you know, most of the people that I saw reacting to this were kind of reacting to it from the standpoint of, ah, oh, there's Georgia. Uh, you know, they're trolling us. They're not going to really wear those black jerseys, which I think is kind of fun. And it is really funny to me the fact that now the black jerseys and the alternate uniforms, which we sometimes see recruits wear, but, you know, Georgia itself almost never wears. I don't believe they've worn the black, what, since 2000? Uh, I'm sorry, 2020, I mean to say. 
Uh, the uh, Mississippi State game in 2020 was the last time we saw George wear the black jerseys, I think. Am I right about that? Maybe it was the uh, bowl game. Yeah, Peach Bowl. That Yeah, thank you, uh, Cody Chaffins. Uh, Peach Bowl there as well that year against Cincinnati. They also wore those, but it's still been a, uh, a good while there on them. Uh, but the point here is uh, that now it's sort of become this thing that Georgia, I, and I think a very humorous way, sort of trolls fans with, especially if you follow the football equipment account. They are so good at this. Because they make these like really uh, seemingly benign posts where there'll be like a black jersey off in the corner or something like that. They, I think they're really good at doing that. And I think it's if they're not going to wear them, then finding some way to have fun with them is probably, I guess, the right way to do this. But I was kind of thinking about this, and this is maybe a bad idea, uh, perhaps not the first bad idea I've had, but I was sort of thinking about this, which is we sort of get the whole backstory and the history on all of this, that – a lot of fans would like to see Georgia wear the alternate uniforms more. In the case of the black jerseys, it is a school color. You kind of know that. So it's not it's not like Florida wearing, you know, those dumb black uniforms they sometimes wear. Or they've even worn, you know, worse stuff than that. Uh, this is not like one of those sort of hideous creations you see on a college football Saturday. In the case of black, it's a school color. It's a very stately look when Georgia has the black jerseys, the red helmets, the silver britches. No one's going to dispute. That's an unbelievably you know, sharp-looking uniform. But there's also kind of a weird backstory involving Georgia and some of those jerseys, and so therefore Kirby Smart, who's so averse to distractions, doesn't want to to have an unnecessary distraction for a football game. And there is a degree to which I sort of get that. This is one of those things where I kind of understand the fans who want to see this stuff a little bit more, and a coach like Kirby Smart who doesn't want any distraction creeping into his preparations during the week because of the way in which – you know, we have a tendency to sort of blow this stuff up perhaps more than we sometimes should. So let me see if I can suggest this as a remedy. We are coming up on the 2024 season. That means you got 24, 25, 26, and then you get to 2027, which would be, I guess, what, three or four years from now? Um, that would be the 20th anniversary of the original blackout. What if for that year, the 2027 season, uh, which, you know, I guess would be four seasons from now, because uh, we haven't had this season yet. What if for the 2027 season, Georgia wore black jerseys for every home game? Now, early in the season, probably a little hot. I'd have to talk to a scientist about if the black jerseys radiate heat more so than the red jerseys would. I honestly don't know. Uh, maybe all that stuff's made up anyway in, in terms of absorbing the heat or whatever. But the NFL team seemed to, to believe in that. But assuming it's not like a disadvantage to be wearing black jerseys in September during the day <laughs> for a noon game against McNeese Day, uh, assuming that's not a huge, you know, sort of like, you know, body temperature disadvantage, what if you wore the black jerseys for every home game that year? And then after that moving forward, but now that's four years away, but after that moving forward, all of a sudden now there's no stigma attached to the black jerseys. Now it's just a fashion choice. And – We've always sort of said black jerseys is a fashion choice, probably a pretty good thing. Black jerseys is a motivational ploy. Yeah, at this point in time, you know, maybe that's not the way, right way for Georgia football to operate. But in honor of the 2007 blackout, because listen, you can say what you want to about other times which maybe the alternate uniforms have been used. There's not a Georgia fan anywhere that did not have a good time for that Auburn game uh, in 2007 when they came out for the very first time. So doing something to honor that, especially in the 20-year anniversary coming up in a few years, Sort of seems like the right thing to do. And if you did wear them for like just a full season, after that, now you could just wear them when you wanted to. Red, black, whatever else. Like half the teams in college football put out a you know a post on X or Instagram every single week. Uh, this is our uniform combo for this week. It just sort of naturally. And it's not controversy. It's just a thing you do. Um, so, you know, kind of finding a way to sort of destigmatize the uh, black uniforms and make it be the kind of thing that Georgia could wear without a whole lot of fanfare. I think wearing them more frequently than last would be a good way to do that. Maybe coming up in a few years, maybe Georgia will do something to sort of honor the 20th anniversary of those being kind of a thing in our life. But either way, Georgia perhaps having a little bit of fun with that yesterday uh, on April Fool's Day, or which we've got to laugh at. We'll make that around the doghouse here today on uh, Dog Nation Daily presented by ServPro. All right, so uh, we're in a good mood here today. Always fun to talk Georgia football, and it's also fun to bring on our next guest there as well. You've seen her on the show here some. You see her around Dog Nation all the time, and she's got some great things going on. So we want to highlight some of them and just uh, talk a little Georgia football there as well. So here today, special guest, Dog Nation Daily presented by Surpro. Can we talk to Kaylee Manzelli on the program right now? 
from Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So let me bring in Kaylee Manziel and let me uh, have the conversation uh, we were just having. Uh, Kaylee, what do you think about the alternate uniforms for Georgia? A, do you like the black uniforms? And are you like a lot of other Georgia fans in the fact that you maybe wish Georgia would wear them a little bit more? I've been to a few Georgia games where they've worn the blackout jerseys, but at the end of the day, I don't care what jerseys they're wearing. I just want to see the dogs play. Um, I liked your theory on them wearing them on the anniversary in the future, but at this point with Georgia football, I'm not going to ever believe that they are wearing the black jerseys until I see them on the field in them. After we got trolled last year at the UAB game by the equipment managers and I spent 20 minutes talking about it on our Dog Nation game day show, I felt so embarrassed. So until I see the players walk out on the field in the coin toss in those black jerseys, I'm never going to believe a single thing that anyone says. Yeah, like yesterday, that was a relatively you know light attempt to kind of get Georgia fans stirred up. But the football equipment account, and I think those guys are really, really funny. Uh, they've had a lot of things where like, I mean, they have really kind of sort of, you know, pushed the envelope with it pretty well. Where, like, you know, you see the black jersey in the box. You see it sort of hanging in a locker. Like, they've definitely had some fun with that over the years. And in a weird way, I kind of enjoy that. I sort of think that's funny. I think that Georgia has a pretty good sense of humor about this. We know that Kirby Smart doesn't like that kind of distraction. doesn't like that kind of conversation. He's sort of all about, you know, what's happening between the white lines. But the fact that Georgia still sort of finds a way to have some fun with this. Recruits seem to love wearing them. I like the fact they at least seem to exist on social media, even if they're not going to quite exist on the football field here right now. Yeah, and I think for the equipment managers, that's that's a lot of commitment and time you have to put into planning that and knowing the conversation that it's going to spark at the end of the day. But it's still nice to see that as serious as this program has gotten in consistency over the last few years, that they're still able to have a good time and make jokes about something and, and get the conversation about the black jersey started. So let me ask you this, too, on this particular topic. So, like, this may be a guy thing, but, like, I think about uniforms all the time, like what uniforms look good when you're watching a game, just two like random teams, random sport, like which uniforms do I like, which uniforms do I not like? You don't get into like, I mean, you're kind of into fashion in general. You don't get into like sports fashion. You don't get into like, you know, uniform fashion overall, because I feel like, I don't know, I spend kind of an inordinate amount of time sort of thinking about that kind of thing. And I certainly don't believe like, black jerseys make Georgia more likely to win. I don't believe in it as a motivational ploy, but I do have a lot of opinions about which uniforms look good, which uniforms don't. I'm kind of a traditionalist, but I think the black jerseys for Georgia, when you match them with the red helmet and the silver britches, it's certainly a sharp look. Do you not get into like uniform fashion in general when it comes to sports? Well, when it comes to the black jerseys, it's all about supply and demand, right? We don't see them wear them that often. So when there's these teases or this opportunity that they might, of course, people are going to talk about it. But I don't really look at uniform fashion as something really serious. I'm I'm here for the color schemes. Like North Carolina has a great color yeah. scheme. Ole Miss has a color scheme. I, I'm ashamed to admit that. Growing up, I was a New York Jets fan because I love that dark green color. And it's kind of stuck with me throughout this time. So I look more for colors. But when it comes to the dogs, I don't care what uniform they're wearing. As long as they come to play, it is a good day at my book. All right, let's talk some football. I talked about Carson Beck a little earlier. Um, I said, hey, I think it's actually a fairly reasonable goal for a guy like Beck who, by coming back to Georgia, you know, decided to push off the NFL draft. And he could have been a high draft pick here this year. You look at the statistical areas when she was already kind of excelling a year ago. I don't think it's unreasonable that Beck could either match or exceed the single season record for touchdowns thrown in the season. Uh, Aaron Murray's got that 36. He's also got the second uh, highest total of 35 there as well. I think it's absolutely reasonable that Carson Beck could match that, exceed that here this year. And that would put him based on, you know, previous kind of years around college football near the top nationally for the uh, season there as well. Do you think a statistical feat like that is within the grasp for Carson here this upcoming season? I I could not agree more. I think whenever you went over earlier what Kirby Smart shared about letting the cat go, I think especially in those first four home games stretch in 2023, we all had heard this talk about how Carson's strength was the long ball, but we didn't see that a lot in those first four games because I do think that in a certain sense, 
Kirby Smart and Mike Bobo were trying to protect Carson from turnovers. And now that they've seen what he can done and how much he's accomplished and grown over this last year, I do think that we're going to get to see him make a lot more of those long balls and and have that decision making on his own. And I mean, this year, the, the biggest difference is, is last year you had safe options. You knew that you could get the ball to Ladd McConkey or Brock Bowers and magic was going to happen, but you don't have that this year. Carson Beck is now the safe option. So he's going to not only have to make the plays that we expect him to make, but also to the play calling is going to be more ambitious and cater to his strength. So I don't think that that's unreasonable. I do think that Carson Beck this year is going to not just exceed, but double what he did last year. And I, I love what you mentioned about what Kirby smart said at ESPN, because like Kirby's at a place in his career, he's had enough success that he can just be honest. And if he feels like, oh, maybe I could have done this a little bit differently, then he has he doesn't feel the need to like cover that up or like make it be something that it's not. And ultimately, the decision didn't cost Georgia games, but the South Carolina game was probably closer than it should have been. The Auburn game was probably closer than it should have been. And so the fact that Kirby Smart says, you know, we may have been a little too careful with Beck uh, at times last year. Uh, the fact that they kind of acknowledge that and now – you're led to believe we're going to turn him loose here this year. A, I think it's kind of cool that Kirby's willing to be honest about that. And B, I think it makes me anticipate that much more just how much they may, like to use your phrase that Kirby used, let the cat go and just be unleashed here this season. I think if you're a Georgia fan, you've got justifiable reason to be pretty excited about that because it sounds like on the basis of that quote, we could see a lot more from Carson here this year. And I'm really glad that we're talking about Kirby's candid comments because in reading what he said about that arrogance that Carson has, a lot of people might see that as a bad thing, but I think that's exactly where you want Carson Beck to be at this point because this time last year, the conversation that we were having about Carson Beck is we knew that he was physically capable of being a quarterback, but we didn't know if he was mentally capable of, of being that. And when you're in this position, you have to have what we call quarterback mentality. If you turn the ball over, if you throw the bar too, fall, too far, you can't think about the last play. You have to have that confidence in yourself and the people around you that you're going to be able to go to the next thing. So I do think that having that arrogance as a quarterback and being able to capture your locker room, I do think that's something that's going to allow Carson Beck to separate himself from what he did last year versus what he's going to do this year. I've also talked to Jake Fromm about this a lot when he joins the show. The fact that his teammates seem to believe in him. Kirby, you know, also saying that to ESPN and I made a big deal about that a moment ago. That means something to me. Kaylee, you grew up playing sports. You know this. It's like teammates know each other in a way that sometimes coaches don't because players are around each other when the coaches are not there. You see each other in the classroom or you see each other you know, in the locker room. You, you know, And there is, even sometimes for great players, there is just something that not all teammates always kind of buy into. Can I really trust this player when the game's going to be on the line, especially for quarterback? And we kind of know the backstory here. I mean, people made a big deal about you know, Beck's driving the Lamborghini and Carson's got, you know, access to NIL money that the average Georgia player, you know, doesn't have access to. And what does that do to the locker room? But apparently it's not doing anything to the Georgia locker room because ultimately if you're a Georgia player, you want your quarterback to be able to lead you to where you want to go. That's what Georgia player, players once believed that Stetson Bennett was capable of doing. And based on what Kirby says there to ESPN, these Georgia players believe in that when it comes to Carson Beck there as well. And the fact that the Georgia players seemingly trust Carson, I put a lot of faith in that as a Georgia fan who obviously wants the best for Georgia this upcoming season. Well, what I think it comes back to is is leading by example. Kirby's been very open about how Carson's not the most vocal leader like a guy like Jake Fromm was, but for him to be able to still hold the respect of the people in that locker room without being that vocal just goes to show what kind of person he is behind the scenes, but also what he's capable of as a quarterback when it comes to physical skill set as well. All right, I want to finish with this topic. We talked about this yesterday. We played some audio of Josh Brooks, the Georgia athletic director, talking about the possibility that Georgia's non-conference trip to UCLA in 2025 might be canceled. Georgia's obviously doing a different kind of SEC schedule now than it was when that game was scheduled a long time ago, by the way. I think you have to go back to 2015 when that game was actually scheduled. And, you know, we had sort of speculated on the show here a little bit that that might get canceled. It appears now that it might. And what I said yesterday was is that I think the average Georgia fan is sort of okay with this, kind of an expensive trip. UCLA is not very good right now. Georgia fans have great memories of Pasadena. 
But I don't know how many Georgia fans are sort of dying to make that trip here right now. I made that case yesterday. I did get an interesting message, though, from a guy named Ed Thomas. I want to read this. Ed says, B.A., I totally d- d- uh, disagree on the UCLA trip. He says, the people I interact with want that trip. He says, better than playing like a ball state in Sanford Stadium. Uh, if it doesn't, it's because UCLA doesn't want to take the L. Well, I do think there's a chance that uh, Ed's right about that, that UCLA sort of realizes they're not the kind of program that needs to be playing Georgia right now. There may be some truth to that. But And I totally respect the idea that maybe more Georgia fans than I realize agree with Ed that they want to go on that trip, they want to do that, and better to do that than play you know, some you know, sort of weak opponent in Sanford Stadium the way that Georgia – had to kind of replace uh, Oklahoma with Ball State for this past season. Maybe more Georgia fans sort of feel that way. But my point on this is, you know, coming up in 2024, expensive trip coming up to Austin. A lot of Georgia fans want to do that. A lot of Georgia fans want to go see the Grove uh, in November for Ole Miss. That's not the easiest trip either. And obviously you're hoping to be a part of the college football playoff here this year and then for as many years into the future as we're capable of seeing that Georgia fans got some travel. Their dance card is pretty full as far as that goes. My suspicion here is there aren't that many Georgia fans who are necessarily all that jazzed about a very expensive trip to go back to Pasadena. They got great memories of the Rose Bowl, but there was some nostalgia kind of played out when Georgia was in L.A. for the 2022 National Championship game. So my point here to you is you kind of have your finger on the pulse when it comes to Georgia fans. You know a lot of them. I talk to them on a regular basis. You think Georgia fans want to go to Pasadena for this, or you think they're okay if this ends up getting canceled? I think that the decision to go to UCLA is very outdated. As you mentioned, this decision was made in 2015 under Mark Rick, not Kirby Smart. Since then, UGA has participated in a Rose Bowl and played the national championship in Los Angeles. So I think it takes away that appeal of of going to the West Coast, going out to California. And I would rather see UGA play somewhere like Vegas in a big yes. opener like that as opposed to going to play a UCLA team that's going to end up as what, six and six? I don't think that does any benefit for our program. I don't think it's going to make the Georgia team any better. Yes, as fans, that might be a fun trip, but I think that there are better places to play and better teams to play against. Yeah, I love interesting road trips, and I think you do too. It's fun, but we're also going to be taking some interesting road trips. I mean, the uh, you know, not every Georgia fan has the means to travel this much, but the ones that can, I think for this upcoming year, they want to go to Texas, Alabama, and Ole Miss, right? That's three road trips they're hoping to take. You don't really quite have the high-profile road game for the 2025 season, but, you know, I mean, after a while, some of this just gets to be kind of expensive. These these playoff trips are expensive. These, you know, uh, ro- you know, the SEC travels, the league gets more spread out. You know, that gets more expensive. I mean, maybe there are some Georgia fans who are like, listen, I can afford to go to all these games, and if you can, then more power to you, I guess. But after a while, some of this gets a little expensive, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that flight is not cheap. And if I'm going to go to UCLA, I want it to be for the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all. I don't want to go just to play UCLA out there. And, two, I'm not a fan of the dry heat. I have a pretty dry skin, so when I come back, I'm like, (laughs) Feeling at the face. So I would just prefer not. And like I said, I would rather open up somewhere like Vegas. Hey, I, well, sir, I love your idea on that. You know, this year, uh, L- LSU and USC are going to open the season there at the nice stadium there in Las Vegas. I just think that's got Georgia written all over. One of these years, I'd love to see Georgia open a season out there. I think that'd be fantastic. I mean, I would love to go. There's no promises that I would come back from it, but, hey, it would be a good time. (laughs) You'd go out with a bang. All right, one of the things we do sometimes when we're having some fun and doing maybe some vacation shows or something like that, we'll do a little Kaylee's Corner. We give you a chance to turn the tables and ask me a question. I think we're going to do that here today. So kind of impromptu here just for fun. How about a Kaylee's Corner where we give you a chance to now ask me a question, pretty much an AMA type thing of anything you want to ask here. It's all on the table. So with that, something I don't do very easily. I yield control of the show over to you. All right. I've got two for you in light of what we just talked about. If you could replace the UCLA home and home with somebody else, who would you replace it with? So if this is like, you know, in just with the spirit of, Hey, the most fun places you could go. I think for me, it would be one of these like big 10 venues that you see on TV a lot, but I've never had the chance to go to. Beaver Stadium in State College, you know, Horseshoe in Columbus, Big House in Michigan. At some point in time, I'd like to get out there and see, you know, up there and see some of those places. The biggest possible road games I think Georgia could play. 
I think it'd be something kind of like that, a horseshoe, a, 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 you know, a happy valley, a, a big house. I think for me it'd probably be something like that. I'd also love to see George. I know this is on the schedule at some point in time, but we'll see if the game ends up getting played. If you want a regional rival, I think Georgia and Doak Campbell Stadium against Florida State would be really fun to get a chance to see that at some point in time. Those are the sort of road trips that I think would be really cool to see Georgia get a chance to take at, at, at some point in the future anyway. I, I can't deny it. I would love to see the Seminole on the horse yeah. and like right there on the 50 yard line just one more time because that was probably the greatest thing that Florida State did in the Orange Bowl this past year was bring out the horse. <laughs> it was all downhill after that for sure. They lost yeah, the 10 touchdowns. Like, yeah. It, it's like the meme of Aaron Rodgers coming in and, and putting the uh, American flag on the Indeed field. And that was the only highlight from that game. That's exactly how it felt with the horse in the Orange Indeed, Bowl. Indeed, that's the case. All right, number two, what player are you most looking forward to watching at G-Day? I think for me, it's probably Colby Young. And, you know, talked to Terrence Edwards about this last week. You know, what we've heard is, is that Young has dazzled at time during practice, and yet he's also been kind of dealing with the ankle injury. What Terrence said last week was well, when he was watching Colby, he didn't really see much effect from the ankle. So this is a guy that has generated probably enough buzz thus far this spring that that would probably be my number one answer. Now, I also kind of want to mention a couple of others there as well. The stuff related to Robert Robinson is fascinating right now. Robinson has just been so talked about, and a lot of this sort of even predates spring practice, that it seems like Robinson has kind of really had a light come on for him. So if Colby Young is my gold medalist in this, I'd say Roderick Robinson is probably my silver medalist. And I would also – Keep the last name theme going here. I'd probably also mention Ellis Robinson there as well on the basis of what Terrence told us about a great interception that Ellis Robinson had to practice the other day. I'd probably go, you know, Young first. I'd go Roderick Robinson probably second just because I've just been fascinated with what we've been hearing about him. And then I'd probably go Ellis Robinson third because it sounds like a guy like that may prove to be pretty tough to keep off the field. Well, I think that Colby Young is an interesting answer because Connor Riley and I actually talked about this on our show last Thursday that with all the big name transfers that have come in this year between Trevor Etienne and London Humphreys, nobody thought that Colby Young would be the transfer portal pickup that people were talking about. And the buzz that he's generated around spring practice, I think a lot of eyes are going to be on him at G Day. Yeah, I think that's right. Kaylee, speaking of that, on Thursdays, you and Connor got a great new show that's out there. I believe we have a new name for it. You guys have done some creative stuff. I saw like the the Wild West shootout y'all had the other day, and obviously y'all did the Oscars here uh, recently. Y'all been very creative. Our buddy Cody Chaffins has obviously been a great contributor on that show, as he does here for this each and every day there as well. So remind folks how they can get some more Kaylee Manziel in their lives. Well, if you want to see me get after Connor Riley every single Thursday, you can do it on any of our social media platforms. Every Thursday at 7 o'clock, I promise you, you never really know what's going to happen or what we're going to talk about. So if you have not watched it yet, I would encourage you to go watch our last episode. Kaylee, it is so good to have you in the program here today. Look forward to doing this a lot in the future. Thanks for being here on Dog Nation Daily presented by Serpro. We'll see you on video Thursday night as well. Thanks, Brandon. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. I always get tangled up in a bunch of wires. I uh, had to untangle myself there for a moment. Hey, good to have Kaylee Manns on the show. Strong stuff from her, as always. If you're going on our Dog Nation cruise, get a chance to spend even more time with Kaylee Manzel because she's going to be with us on Allure of the Seas. And speaking of Royal Caribbean, let's go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And when I think about Royal Caribbean, one of the things I think about is the fun I just had on board Icon of the Seas. I was there in January, and it was something that kind of got me excited for our Dog Nation cruise, but also... It was a chance to see something we'd been hearing about for really a couple of years. And you know, it's one of those deals where obviously the sponsors we're lucky enough to have here on our program are sponsors that are on the program because of the personal belief I have in them. A lot of y'all know, personally speaking, I'm a very big fan of Royal Caribbean. So it was one of those deals where for months and months and months, we were talking about the potential or you know the, the eventual, I mean to say, debut of Icon of the Seas. I kept thinking, man, I hope I get a chance to be on this ship. I hope, hope I get a chance to do this. I hope I get a chance to do that. And we just talked about this so much and finally got a chance to do that and see with my own eyes the stuff that we had been talking about here on the program. And I tell you, I was just blown away by it. There are just so many things about Icon of the Seas that just make it an unbelievable cruise vacation experience. One of the things we say a lot is, is that the thing that Royal Caribbean, I think, really probably invests in 
and sets them apart from so many other you know potential players in that space like the entertainment options and you know, they have the broadway style shows on board the ship and the 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 production that's on board icon of the seas is the wizard of oz you know i cannot believe the sort of stage production that exists on sea when it comes to the wizard of oz and you know fun things like the the category six you know water park and you, know, you get the crown's edge when you i told you about doing this where you kind of you know do all it's almost like a kind of a sort of a zipline type thing around the outside of the park it's like a you know a theme park attraction almost really there's just so many fun things to do on board icon of the seas and so i want you to talk to jessica slater and she'll tell you more about that today you can give her a call 770-718-9147 that's 770-718-9147 you can also email her jay slater at dreamvacations.com you may say well who is jessica slater she is a travel agent she doesn't work for royal caribbean but she was introduced to us by royal caribbean because royal caribbean believes that a great royal caribbean cruise vacation made even better when you have a terrific travel agent to help you plan that that's what jessica slater is so she can get you set up on everything you need to do uh with royal caribbean here today by the way how about that water slide right there one of those what do you call them like drop slides or whatever when uh you know you bottom drops out and you just take off uh, that's a lot of fun and uh, good stuff to do there with our friends at Royal Caribbean. All right, let's go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here for a moment. And let's do an update quickly. Before we talk about Paul Feinbaum there, can we do a quick update on recruiting there too? Because uh, this week, and I believe it's today, you've got Matt Zollers, the quarterback, coming in to visit UGA. And the chatter here right now, I want to show you some of this on the screen here. Uh, our friends over at On3 were kind of discussing this. So, you just had the Penn State visit for Zollers. He obviously hails from Pennsylvania. He's got a family tied to Pitt. So Pitt, Penn State are a factor in this recruitment. The visit taking place essentially now for Zollers to UGA. But our, our folks over at On3 also talking about Missouri continuing to be a player in on all this. It's been described as a good position Missouri is in ahead of his commitment coming up there on Thursday. And you, know, you kind of listen to other online chatter and you sort of talk to people who know some people who know some people. It does certainly seem like Missouri is going to be a little bit of a factor for Zollers here. And the one thing you got to give credit for is Eli Drinkwitz has done something at Missouri that sort of feels a little bit real. They were top 10 team a year ago. And part of the reason they were a top 10 team was, and I'll be honest, I did not expect much from Brady Cook at the quarterback spot for Missouri this past season. Uh, and you know, Drinkwitz turned him into a much better player than I thought probably Brady Cook ever would be. And so, you know, I can understand why quarterbacks would give Drinkwitz a little bit of attention. Now, I do think that beyond Brady Cook for this upcoming year, I think the backup quarterback situation for Missouri might be a little bit of an unknown uh, situation here right now, and they probably need to do something about that. But in the case of Zollers, you know, taking Missouri somewhat seriously, I think it's fairly easy to understand why that might be the case. And if it is indeed a case where Georgia is battling Missouri more so than either Penn State or Pitt, once again, I think you can sort of understand why that might be the case. A lot of Georgia fans hope Zollers chooses UGA. Uh, we'll find out if that's what's in the offering here later on this week, and we'll find out, you know, is the bigger threat to Georgia one of those in-state schools for Zollers, either Penn State or Pitt, or is it a program like Missouri? Kind of a fascinating uh, recruiting development to uh, watch here as Zollers gets ready to take his visit to Georgia here this week. Uh, Paul Feinbaum was on his show this week to change the subject here. He's bragging on Greg Byrne, Ath Alabama Athletic Director. Stop me if you've heard this before, the uh, Feinbaum show, talking about how great Alabama is. But uh, nonetheless, um, according to Feinbaum, Greg Byrne might be the best athletic director in all of college athletics here right now. And this is the sort of thing that happens when you've been a football school and you have success in basketball the way that uh, Alabama is right now. Obviously, the athletic director gets some credit for that. And it certainly seems like, I mean, Alabama has built a basketball program that is legitimately pretty impressive. We said this yesterday that Nate Oates right now, I think, has kind of moved into a category of, you know, in kind of a post-Jay Wright, post-Coach K, you know, not all that long ago, Roy Williams left the sport. You know, you've seen kind of a brain drain from college basketball where a lot of the, you know, seasoned, experienced coaches have sort of moved on that – there was a little bit of an open competition to see, okay, who are the new kind of top flight coaches in the sport? And, uh, you know, to, to the credit of uh, Greg uh, or Nate Oates, he seems to have kind of moved into that category. And obviously Greg Byrne gets credit for making that higher and kind of building the Alabama program to what it is. But can we also be honest about this? I know we're all into basketball right now and it's March Madness and everything else. But 
the real judgment on Greg Byrne is about to happen because Byrne was tasked with maybe the most difficult thing that any athletic director has been tasked with so far in the 21st century. He had to hire Nick Saban's replacement. And it's not easy. We all know this to be the guy after the guy. But you can't fall flat on your face. You can't fall off the face of the earth. And when you look at the current landscape in the SEC, whether it be national media chatter or betting odds or things like that, as of right now, Alabama is sort of playing fourth fiddle in the SEC here at the moment. You know, George obviously is expected to be better. Texas is expected to be better. But really, I mean, a team like Ole Miss is currently being viewed as having better playoff odds than Alabama is. Right now, Alabama has kind of been kind of being treated during the offseason as the fourth best team in the SEC. And for Alabama fans, that's not going to be good enough. And if if that's about what Alabama is, or if that's about what Alabama remains, even in the era of the 12 team and soon to be 14 team playoff, I can promise you the things being said about Greg Byrne, they will not be said at that particular time. So uh, Paul Feinbaum, a lot of compliments and praise for coming the direction of Greg Byrne, the Af- Alabama athletic director. Let's let's see how many compliments Byrne is still getting once we see what Kalen DeBoer is going to look like as the replacement for Nick Saban. That's the real judgment to come on Byrne there. I saw where Shadour Sanders got a new vehicle. He got one of these, like, Tesla trucks or whatever, and I, this is a very petty thing to say. I, I just have to admit. But I saw it retail somewhere in the neighborhood of, like, $80,000 or something like that, which is far more expensive than the car that I drive, for sure. But we talked a lot about Carson Beck at the top of the show. There was a weird sort of point of personal pride here of uh, Shadour's bragging about his new car, but it's way cheaper. It's like half as expensive as Carson Beck's car. So uh, I guess you'll give a little nod to uh, Carson Beck here on this. Shadour's been you know, maybe the most talked about player in college football the last couple of years, but his NIL deal only affords him a car that's about half the uh, manufacturer's suggested retail price of what Carson Beck's driving. So a little, uh, little, little, a little bit of a check in the box for uh, Carson Beck there on that. And then one final story to give you here for a moment. One of the kind of interesting off-season soap operas we've been following is Ohio State's pursuit of a running backs coach after their guy left to go to Michigan. Then they went after DeMarco Murray from Oklahoma, didn't get him. And, you know, for all of the positive things that have seemingly happened for Ohio State during the offseason, they have been without a running backs coach, obviously at a time in which the 2025 recruiting class is sort of kicking into gear. It does appear that's now been solved, though. It looks like Carlos Lachlan, who has been running backs coach at Oregon, is about to uh, become uh, running backs coach at Ohio State. So if you're keeping score here, of the new Big Ten teams coming from the Pac-12 over to the Big Ten, Ohio State steals UCLA's head coach, makes him OC. It looks like they're going to reach to Eugene, Oregon, steal their running backs coach and make him their guy there. Lachlan has a pretty good uh, reputation with recruits, so... When it's all said and done, it looks like Ohio State's going to probably end up making a pretty good hire here at a time in which, you know, recruits are kind of paying close attention to this kind of stuff. So one of the sort of last remaining sizable position coach openings looks like that's about to be filled, and we'll make that cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And before we wrap up today, let me also give a shout-out to our friends at Mr. Electric, Dog Nation's choice for residential and commercial electrical needs. Now, listen – They've got uh, all kinds of things going on for them. They've been in business for more than 30 years, taking care of folks on a regular basis, doing repair work, doing installations, lighting work, and, of course, doing all of this with the utmost respect for electrical safety. they got a team of licensed experts and insured electricians uh, that offer upfront flat rate pricing. So you love that, whether it's like a 24-hour emergency situation where on a moment's notice you need them to come over and take care of you, or if you just need a quote for some work you want to get done, Mr. Electric is right there for you. And... The good thing there as well, there is a $29 service fee that is waived anytime you get some repair work done. They're a neighborly company, and so that's why I want you to check them out today. Find them online, MrElectricAtlanta.com. One more time, that's MrElectricAtlanta.com for a lot more on that. And as we say goodbye to you here today, we'll do so with a uh, couple of golden shoes here. Our buddy Mad Dog. You know, we've admitted before that we've been kind of haters during March Madness here a little bit. Now, we're excited about Georgia tonight, by the way, NIT tournament against Seton Hall. That should be a lot of fun. And Hinkle Fieldhouse, obviously, if you grew up loving the movie Hoosiers, you love the idea of seeing Georgia tonight playing in the venue where, you know, the state championship was decided for the Hickory 
uh, uh, what do you call them? Hickory, uh, whatever they were, uh, with Norman Dale. Uh, so you're looking forward to George tonight, but when it comes to the NCAA term, we've come in kind of haters with all of this. So uh, our buddy Mad Dog had a very funny golden shoe submission. Uh, tremendous. I believe this is AI aided artwork here of the Purdue Boilermaker train running over Smokey. He says, when you fail to derail the Boilermakers, hashtag March Madness. Good stuff from Mad Dog. Golden Shoe coming his way there on that. And our buddy Ryan Walker always sends such interesting things, also sends us this, this. You know, last week we talked about the passing of Louis Gossett Jr., the tremendous actor, and some of the great movies that he was a part of. I did not know this until Ryan told me that that uh, Lou Gossett was also a local sports fan. You see him there wearing a Braves jersey, posing with Quincy Carter. Apparently, Gossett was also a UGA fan there as well. Uh, Ryan Walker says he'll be truly missed. We totally agree with that. During our R.S. Andrews cool down last week, we ended up kind of getting under the subject of Lou Gossett, some of the great movies he was a part of, and happy moments of my childhood that involved movies that he was in. And Ryan Walker shares a really interesting picture there of Quincy Carter and uh, Lou Gossett Jr. together. Really fascinating. Uh, good stuff there from Ryan We'll give him a golden shoe there as well. Uh, lousy stinking Gators have about 1,242 days. That's how long it's been since uh, Florida has beaten Georgia, and that is a fun thing to consider, our Gator Hater Updater. Hope all of you have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by SurfPro. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs, showing up on time. Doing the work that's promised, the price is promised. That's what R.S. Andrews is all about. Story after story, they deliver smiles. That's been their model for a long time, and they can deliver smiles for you uh, today. So make sure you check them out as we get going into spring and all the uh, air conditioning stuff that people need to be done. Somebody's told you need a new A.C. unit, but our friends at R.S. Andrews may be able to tell you how to get some new life out of that old unit. Uh, so find them online for more on that today. All right, let's get your comments here via YouTube to begin. And we'll see what everybody else has got going on uh, as well on all the other platforms. Good stuff from Kaylee today. That was fun. A little Carson Beck talk off the beginning. You love that there as well. Uh, Jonathan Aaron, speaking of like alternate uniforms for UGA, he says, how about Georgia wears the Power Ranger uniforms again? Now, listen, those are hideous. <laughs> that is something I don't have any nostalgia for. No uh, nostalgia about that. Uh, Spencer Clark mentioned Kaylin Clark. Yeah, amazing performance for her last night. Um, and really just amazing career, both in terms of what she's doing on the court, but also the interest that she's generating. I mean, it's amazing how many people, because I'll be completely honest, there are a lot of times which stuff like this, I sort of seem, I sort of feel like is artificially inflated. You know, it's like, it's, you know, I'm not quite so sure how real all of this is. The Caitlin Clark phenomenon is completely real in the fact that I have so many people that I've just noticed just sort of bring her up in conversation that, that I was talking to a gentleman the other day, completely unrelated to any of this. And he just started talking about Caitlin Clark, how impressed he was with her as a player. It's like, this is a real thing like that. You know, the Clark phenomenon is, is, is truly real. So, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of, you know, I sort of like the sports that I like and can't always pretend to, to know a whole lot about sports. I don't follow quite as much, but, uh, everybody knows who, uh, Caitlin Clark is for sure. Um, let's see what else. Uh, a lot of comments coming in here. Let's see what they're doing. <laughs> Sling of Lake Napier wonders if the uh, G-Day game is going to be more competitive than the Orange Bowl, which is a very funny line, and one can assume that it probably will be for sure. Uh, uh, Foster Moss says, did Dari get the AC fix? Yeah, so uh, it was really funny. So yesterday, I think I told you. Um, I know that I did because I was whining about it. It was so hot. So hot in here. Um, and weirdly enough, when the show was over, as I was kind of posting the podcast and some things like that, finally the AC kind of kicked on. And you can, uh, uh, you know, ask uh, Cody and Kaylee, they'll attest to this. It's like so much colder in here today. Like I would say more often than not, our studio is actually a little cold. And so like yesterday, it's probably 80 in here. And today it's like 60. You average it out, it's like 70. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll give Daria Capero some credit for that for sure. Uh, for sure. Um, let's see what else. We got a lot of comments. I can't, some of these I can't quite tell what they're about, but we do have a lot of comments. Lance D says, Caitlin Clark's an absolutely fantastic player. No idea why she gets so much grief in certain circles, and it's sad that she does. Um, 
Yeah, I can't really comment on that as much just because I'm not an expert on that brand of the sport necessarily. Um, but it definitely seems like Caitlin Clark is sort of fodder for hot takes, which in a way I sort of find to be funny. I mean, I, I think that's kind of fun, uh, some of that anyway. Uh, you know, uh, but like, like I'm not an expert on women's basketball, nor can I pretend to be. But uh, but Caitlin Clark is certainly a phenomenon. Oh, with Frank Patterson mentioning road trips, he says, well, what about Wisconsin? Yeah, I, I would say that Camp Randall's on my list. I would. And Alabama's playing there this year, is that right? Is Alabama playing at, at Wisconsin this year, I think? Um, I get. I would say that's a, a, a road trip I'd like to take. I think you're right about that, Frank. Um, yeah, I can't. <laughs> There's a very spirited conversation going on on YouTube. I can't 100% tell what it is about. Um, <laughs> Gary Roach says, whatever happened to Laneith Whitehead? Yeah, he's there still, I think. But it's also just really crowded. I mean, he came over as a walk-on. So it's pretty crowded at Georgia, the running back spot. But he's there. He's you know going to be able to contribute. He also said we showed a funny uh, video last week of uh, Crying Day. Um, I don't quite remember that one, but that's but that's good stuff. Uh, Jesse P- uh, Peterson says, bring on the red bridges with the black jerseys would be fire. Yeah, so here's where I'm kind of weird about some of this kind of stuff. Like, I have definitely evolved to be a little bit okay with some alternate uniforms for UGA. And in my mind, sometimes I do kind of envision what if they did this and what if they did that? Like, for instance, one of the alternate jerseys that looks that I think might look cool for Georgia is that they wore like a silver jersey to match the silver britches with the red helmet. I think that might look good. But while I have definitely evolved to be a lot more receptive to that kind of thing, I don't want Georgia to wear a different uniform every week. I don't. And so, you know, like I would use Ohio State as an example of this. Ohio State's a classic team, has kind of a classic look. It's undoubtedly a heritage program. And some weeks when you tune in, you can't even tell that it's Ohio State because they're wearing, you know, some hideous garb. Um, I would not want Georgia to do that. And so that's why I sort of feel like that the moment we do one alternate uniform, we're like, okay, let's do a black jersey. All of a sudden now, and I'm not picking on the commenter, I'm just saying that this is what happens, and it's I understand why it does. I do some of this in my head there as well. What if you wore this and this and this and this, and pretty soon – you know, it's like creative juices start flowing, and now you've got Georgia wearing a different uniform every week, which is kind of not what I would want. Um, but I do think that'd probably be a cool look there. Uh, yeah, Foster Moss says sometimes Ohio State even does the all black, and black may be no Ohio State color, yeah. Um, Jonathan Aaron says, what if Georgia played Penn State at the wideout and they wore the black uniforms? <laughs> that could be kind of interesting. Um how about this? UGA boy for life brunetti says, I'm taking my best friend and lifelong diehard Gator fan to the cocktail party this year, so we're going to have to agree to disagree for 60 minutes, then go get a beer after that. I'm a big Gator hater and a uh, Tennessee hater there too. Yeah, so it's always funny when, you know, good friends, different different sort of fan allegiances go to the game together. It creates a little bit of tension. So you'll have to tell us how that goes, uh, Brunetti. That should be pretty interesting. Um, George on tap says, yeah, tell Kaylee the heat's a little dry in Vegas as well. Yeah. Uh, definitely so. I would say that, you know, I used to go to Las Vegas kind of a lot when I was younger. I don't go anymore. I don't do anything anymore other than take care of my kids. But, um, like, the dry heat in Vegas is a very weird thing because, you know, it's like you go to the pool. When you get out of the pool, it can be 100-something degrees, but it almost feels a little cold when you first get out of the pool because you're so used to, like, the humidity just, like, wrapping around you the moment you're outside in a situation like that. Dry heat is a very strange thing. Very strange thing. Paul Moon says our linebacker room is insane. I would agree with that. Uh, PDT says WrestleMania this weekend. Confused to why they let Cody get beat up for the second week in a row. Usually it's one week. One of them gets beat up the next week. The other gets beat up before the big show. Yes, yeah, so I think I have not seen this week's Raw, but I have been following the build-up to WrestleMania, and I think they've told the story really well. I do. And um, as far as, like, Cody getting beaten up several weeks in a row, I mean – I, I I sort of like the old school thing where, like, 
the bad guy faction is just unbeatable and you know the good guy is sort of facing the longest odds in the world. I mean, the expectation I have is that Cody's going to win, but I like building up the bad guy as much as possible for the big event. I really do. So I don't mind the good guy getting kicked around a lot. I know there was the real, and plus like, you know, rock is well liked. And so you got to work really hard to make rock a heel. You've got to really, you've got to have him do some bad things to be a heel. And, you know, I guess the thing with the belt and, you know, Cody's mom of the day is kind of an example of that. But, um, I think the buildup to WrestleMania has been great. Uh, the other day I saw where Triple H said that they he felt like they were kind of in an era similar to like the Attitude Era of the '90s. I kind of agree with that. I, I think I think that wrestling's pretty hot right now. I really do. I think wrestling's pretty hot right now. Um, uh, Thor rules also mentioning something else we've had some fun with the fact that Ohio State missed the shot against Georgia in basketball. Uh, very very similar to the missed kick in the Peach Bowl. He says, I heard Ryan Day around the court claiming that Bullard targeted their shooter. That's very funny, Thor. Yeah, we've had some fun with that uh, topic ourselves around here. Uh, by the way, uh, Sling Blade Napier on now at dognation.com says that he and his wife are hoping that the UCLA trip stays. We're going to make a whole week out of it. If it changes, I'd like to see another decent home game to maximize that season ticket in 2025. Well, given what the home schedule probably already is, I'm guessing that if Georgia doesn't um, – you know, doesn't do the UCLA game, it's probably going to be, as one of our commenters mentioned, a Ball State type situation. That's probably what it's going to be. You know, like, road games are expensive. You know, Georgia, huge travel party, right? Very, very expensive. It's it, it, it's a, you know, a relatively high six-figure deal just to travel to one of these games. And when you do a home-and-home, home, you don't get a check for coming. You just, you know, you trade it for the home game the following year. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, not only will Georgia maybe not go to UCLA, but when the renovations get done at the Jacksonville Stadium, they're, they're not doing home and home for that either. At least I think there's a really good chance they don't do home and home for that. They may do two other neutral site venues just to avoid the expense of the road game. So, yeah, so we've hit, we've heard from a couple of Georgia fans who wish that game would sort of stay on the calendar. Uh, you know, perhaps there are more Georgia fans that were looking forward to that trip than I thought. Uh, and I'm not like, anti going to Pasadena. It would have been fun to do, but it is really, really expensive for a game that, uh, you know, probably will not be of a very high magnitude. And, you know, if you want the nostalgia thing of thinking back to the, to the Rose bowl, you know, a lot of Georgia fans did have the chance to be in LA not all that long ago, but, but I also am willing to have respect for commenter, you know, to me on X and now uh sling blade who's mentioning the fact they wish they could have gone. So perhaps more Georgia fans feel that way than I realize. Let me go to Facebook for a minute. On Facebook. Let's see how folks are doing over here. Um. Miriam Corbin, who does travel to all these games, says it is really expensive to travel. You know, yeah, a lot of these games just get more and more expensive all the time, for sure. For sure. Um, for sure. Alan Verbonching and Bill Sanders talking about how dry heat, so you got to keep drinking that water. Yeah, I mean, I think it does kind of sneak up on you a little bit, right? Whereas, like, the humid heat we have down here, maybe I'm just more used to it. I think you're constantly always aware of how hot it is. But perhaps that dry heat maybe just sort of sneaks up on you just a little bit more. Uh, Jerry Popham doesn't like professional wrestling. Listen, it's not for everybody. But um, I also have never been like, you know, I just sort of like what I like. Uh, and, like, I'm sort of at an age now where I don't make much in the way of apologies for what I do like, and I don't make much apologies in the way for what I don't like either. You know, it's like there's some things that I like, there's some things that I don't like, and I just sort of, you know, I just sort of am what I am on that. I do sort of get, even you know, if you don't like wrestling, it sort of feels like the strangest thing in the world to like. But, um, but also if you've grown up with it and you've enjoyed it as long as some of us have, um, it's always – like wrestling is one of those deals where – you know, over the course of time, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. A lot of that just sort of depends on who the stars are of a given moment. And it's always a good feeling, I think, when wrestling really delivers. 
And lately, it's just really been delivering. Um, and Gerald Harmon brings up a good point. The new NCAA video game giving the option for George to wear alternate uniforms, including like the all-wide or something like that. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, Gerald. I hope that is the case there as well. Um, Bill Sanders uh, says he took a, f- a friend who was a Florida fan to the cocktail party, said she wanted to leave at halftime a few years ago. So, yeah, Bill, sometimes that happens there too. Um, uh, Barry Watkins says bring on Nebraska for a home and home. Is Lincoln thought to be a good place to go? I don't really know a ton about Lincoln. Is that a good place to go? I mean, certainly a very passionate fan base. I, I wonder. Um, uh, Brian Hudson, Johnny Prescott, talking about the big night for Caitlin Clark last night. William Camacho does not like my idea of wearing a, a silver jersey to match the silver britches, which is probably understandable. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Alan Verbonji, Eric Ray, talking about the fact, I think as Alan said, they may eventually change the name of the Southeastern Conference because it's not Southeast anymore. I can definitely see a situation where they start going by the letters a lot more, SEC, without you know really talking about what the SEC stands for. I could definitely see a situation like that. Keith Fold says, just whatever you do with the Georgia uniform, just don't mess with the red helmet. Yeah, that's the iconic thing that I would not want to change very much. Um, Eric Gray says, do you think the SEC championship game will be done away with now that we have 12 teams and possibly 14 in the playoffs? I don't know. I mean, for the foreseeable future, I don't think anything's going to change with that because, you know, it all comes down to money and they still make a lot of money off of it. But I definitely think that there is a pretty uncertain future for conference championship games overall. You know, for instance, you know, in basketball, we saw obviously this year NC State make the Final Four after making the tournament because of the fact they won the ACC tournament. But, you know, a lot of our folks who follow college basketball closely know this. The selection committee doesn't even hide the fact they don't watch the conference tournaments. Uh, you have the the cool thing with NC State this year, but in terms of who gets awarded an at-large or something like that, you almost have no chance to play your way into an at-large on the basis of a conference basketball tournament. We don't talk a lot of college basketball, but people who do talk a lot of college basketball talk about this kind of thing all the time, that you have this thing that exists. The games are really fun. Uh, Betters love the conference tournaments, love them. So it's like this kind of cool event, but the committee itself doesn't watch them at all. They are essentially irrelevant in the eyes of the of the constituency that matters, the, the 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 tournament selection committee. And I sort of wonder in an expanded playoff world, you know, is that kind of a foreshadowing of the future of the conference title of games there as well, where in most situations, and it's kind of hard to sort of mathematically think of a scenario in which this wouldn't be true, both teams in the SEC championship game are going to already be in the playoff. Um and so you're sort of left to wonder, well, what's the SEC championship game really for, if that be the case? Now, you, by winning it, you get the bye. But if you're like the five seed in the playoff, you are not stressed out about that. Now, Kirby said in one of the interviews that he did recently that, you know, playing the title game and then having to play again a couple of weeks later in a kind of a first-round playoff situation, not very fun. And that may be another thing that, you know, puts the SEC title game or championship games in a little bit of uh, jeopardy. The other thing for us to keep in mind, too, on this particular topic is is that the SEC championship game is a really big deal. In fact, I'd say, pound for pound, the SEC championship game is probably my favorite sporting event. Uh, it is a unbelievable experience, and it always has been. And I've been you know, fortunate enough to even go to the SEC championship in years in which Georgia wasn't in the game. And it's just a great sporting event. It is a great sporting event. Everybody cares about it. It's one of the great success stories in sports of my lifetime, you know, to see this game invented and see what it's become. It's amazing. Most conference title games, though, are not like that. Uh, You know, they don't sell a lot of tickets. There's not a lot of competition. Uh, So 
you can make a case that now and for a, a good while, the SEC title game has sort of been the only title game that really matters. It seems like the Big 12 title game probably does the best job of producing competitive games. But a lot of these title games don't matter very much. And so in terms of what's their future going to be, it's probably important to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of these leagues have had a hard time, you know, making their title game into something that feels like what the SEC title game feels like. So point is, I can't guarantee this will be always something that's in our life because, you know, we're seeing all kinds of change taking place right now. Timothy Wilson uh, asked about the time for the spring game. I believe that's 1 p.m. there for that that day. It's streaming SEC Network Plus, uh, 1 p.m. there for that. Um, Matt Rukavina says first ACC game was Clemson versus BC. Only half the stadium was filled. Yeah, they've had a lot of times over the years in which that ACC game was about a half-filled stadium, for sure. Um, uh, let us see what else. Back on YouTube here for a moment. Uh, Howard Eubanks says over under on Sunbelt Billy gone in two years. I'd say under. I think that I think that Billy Napier in all likelihood will be fired during the season for Florida. I think Florida sort of already knows they want to do that. I think that Florida was playing such a tough schedule this year that they didn't really feel the need to introduce a new coach to this schedule. Probably wouldn't be very uh, smart for them to do that. But I do believe that 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 Napier is. If you're making a list of the hottest seats in college football, Napier would have to have the hottest seat overall, I think, among the hottest seats for sure. And I would say there's a very strong likelihood that Billy gets fired during the year. Because keep in mind this, if you're moving up the signing period to the beginning part of December, you're going to probably also, especially with Transfer Portal there as well, you're probably moving the coaching carousel up too. And so we saw more coaches fired in season a year ago than we typically do, and I think the reasons I just mentioned were probably why that was. And I think you could start seeing this happen even earlier here this year. The Florida schedule gets much tougher later, but it's no cupcake at the beginning either. So a couple of losses, that may need, that may be all Florida needs to see to go ahead and start the clock on trying to determine who Napier's replacement is going to be and try to find some way to salvage – that December, January time of trying to rebuild a roster for the future year, because ultimately the first line of Napier's obituary as Florida coach is going to end up being that he just never found a way to upgrade the roster the way that he needed to. And I think some of this in some respects, you know, I, I don't really necessarily know what to attribute it to, but he never quite made the splash in the transfer portal. He was perhaps supposed to. Foster Moss says Billy's not making it to the cocktail party. That's that's probably a better over-under. Will Napier coach against Georgia? I'd say there's at least a 50% chance that he doesn't. Foster, that's a really good way to put it. I'd say there's at least a 50% chance that Napier does not coach against Georgia. Really good point. Um, Lysol operator says that he won't be fired until after the season. Yeah, I don't agree with that. He says, if he is before, we won't know. UF ain't trying to spiral even more. Yeah, I I, I get the point that you're coming from Lysol. I do think that they fully understand the fact that there is a little bit of a spiral here when you fire a coach that you hastily hired because of the other coach that you fired who you somewhat hastily hired because of the previous coach that you fired. Like, I do think they have understanding of that, but – Moving up the signing period at the beginning of December does not does not coincide very well with keeping a coach through the season. It just doesn't. Um, I I think we see more coaches fired in season. I think we may see them fired earlier. So if 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 it's in the cards for Napier to get fired, then he could certainly be one of the guys that that deals with that. Now, DeMart also brings up a really good point um, that if Napier gets fired, as we've said before, the issue here is that Scott Strickland probably gets fired too. That, you know, if you're Scott Strickland, how many failed football coaches do you get a chance to hire? Uh, that, that's, that, that's another good point there as well, which, you know, perhaps that causes the, the, the uh, Florida thing to linger here a little bit. But one way or another, 
if you're Florida, you need two things to be true for D for 2025. Two things you need to be true for 2025. A, you need DJ Lagway to still be on your roster. And B, you gotta have a better roster overall than you have right now. And that's almost more important than whoever the coach is and who the athletic director is, certainly. That Florida's got to do something to have a better roster in place uh, for 2025 and keep what they think is a quarterback prospect in DJ Lagway, keep him on the roster there as well. So it could be, it could be really ugly really fast if all of the donor class basically revolts against the entire athletic department um, because of a really bad football situation. I, I, really good comments on that topic. Both um, a lot of really good comments on that topic. Howard Eubank says the schedule put the nail in the coffin for UF. In some respects, that's true. And y'all know I'm a Gator hater. And I like making fun of them. But their schedule is no joke. It may be the hardest schedule I've ever seen any team play. It really might be the hardest schedule ever. Um, and, and you know, a lot of SEC schedules are now more difficult. But Florida's also, as we've said, they're playing every Power 5 team in their own state. And as it stands right now, like, Florida's not better than UCF. They don't have a better coach. They're not a better team. Like, UCF is a tough game for Florida. Uh, and Miami certainly is, uh, for sure. Uh, all right, last trip around uh, dognation.com and Facebook. Let's see what else is going on here. Go back on Facebook here before we say goodbye. How about this? Um, is Marshall Fleming checking in from Cancun here today? Um, I know he had uh, terrible damage from the tornado. Uh, so, Marshall, our prayers are still out with you there on that. Keep us updated on how that's going for you. Uh, I know that's tough. Alan Verbachek predicts that uh, Steve Spurs is going to come out of retirement for Florida. Listen, that may it may take something like that. Um, all right, we're going to go for now. Good comments, y'all. A really interesting conversation here today. Uh, y'all check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com. Air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric. Uh, it is warm, so, uh, you know, air conditioning units being used. Uh, ours is feeling good here today. If yours is not, or if you're worried that that old, you know, well beyond its shelf life air conditioning unit that you have, may need to be replaced. Eventually, it's going to have to be. You know that. But maybe just one more summer, maybe just like one more summer out of that old AC unit. Let RS Andrews get it tuned back up to factory fresh specs for you. You can find them online, rsandrews.com, and it may only cost you 99 bucks, which is a lot cheaper than a new unit would cost. So find out a way to do that online, rsandrews.com. And, we'll of course, see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Surfro. We'll talk to you then, everybody.